This is the largest prime number ever computed by humans with a whopping 41,024,320 digits, exceeding the character length of the Bible tenfold with some more. If you were to print it on standard A4 paper, it would literally be this thick. But what on earth is going on? How did we ever find such a ridiculously large number and why are mathematicians so obsessed over it? Like really, why is this important at all? Well, it isn't. Just kidding. To start, I want to clarify that prime numbers are simply any number with only two factors, that being one and itself. You probably learned this in like third grade, so it's really not that hard to understand. But what is difficult to understand is the fact that we know so little about them. Like, say our goal is to find the largest prime number. Well, to do this, let's see if there actually is a largest prime number. Euclid figured out in 300 BC, using proof by contradiction, that there are infinite primes. This is a method of proof where you assume the opposite. In this case, there are finite primes. Then you find a contradiction. In this case, Euclid states if there are finite primes, you should be able to multiply them all together and add one to get another number. The issue here is that this new number would not have any of the primes as their factor, meaning it in itself would be a new prime number. Therefore, there can't be finite primes, and there are an infinite number of prime numbers in the number line. So there is no largest prime number, just like there is no largest number. But humans can't just slam their heads on computers to compute infinity. The natural continuation of this goal would be to see how big we can get. But how can they actually figure out prime numbers outside of just choosing random numbers and testing if they're prime? Could I just get some nice function and say I want the fourth prime and the function goes, oh sure, diddly scrumptious, oh fine, that sounds dandy, and give me seven? Well, yes, it's called Willens's formula, but it absolutely sucks at being computationally efficient. Notice this factorial here. Spoiler alert, this grows really quickly and the function basically dies before reaching a remotely big number. So without a way to know the primes, how did mathematicians figure out that this was prime? Well, they guessed, but it was a very good guess. And before we talk about this, we should know some ways mathematicians can test for primes. The most obvious way is to divide the number by every natural number from two up until its square root, basically checking all of its possible factors. Pros, it works by definition cons, for larger numbers it just isn't computationally feasible. So mathematicians looked for more efficient methods. One of them was to determine whether a number was likely to be prime. Fermat's little theorem, funny name I know, states that for any prime number p, a to the p minus a is divisible by p where a is any integer. For example, if a is 2 and p is the prime number 3, 8 minus 2 is equal to 6, which is divisible by 3. In modular arithmetic, it is common practice for mathematicians to write a tri-bar and a mod short for modulo to indicate that the left-hand side has a remainder of the right-hand side when divided by the modulo number. As such, mathematicians love to write it this way, read a to the p minus a is congruent to zero modulo p, indicating there is no remainder when divided by p. This can also be rearranged to look like this, or this, or this. Understanding the proof is important, but it is way too cumbersome to include and we won't dwell too long on this theorem anyway. The point is, it can be used as a much more efficient way to check whether a number is prime. But there is one major problem. The test only goes one way. The theorem states that if a number fails, it is not prime. 100% no strings attached. However, if a number passes, it doesn't guarantee it is prime. Many composite numbers, known as Carmichael numbers or pseudo-primes, slip through security. So this is a no-go. Okay, enough yap. Let's just get to the technique they used to get this. Drumroll please, Mersenne primes. Primes are annoying to deal with, so mathematicians focus on a very special subset. Here's the idea. If a prime can be written as 2 to the power of p minus 1, where p is a positive integer, we can categorize it as a Mersenne prime. Even better, Mersenne primes can only be prime when p itself is prime. The reason behind this is because any composite power can be factored using a difference of powers. You've probably never seen this formula before, but you might recognize some of its special cases, such as the difference of squares or the difference of cubes. 
Point is, it reduces the pool of prime numbers. But how do we test if they're prime? Well, using the Lucas Lema test, or LLT. What's that I hear you ask? Well, define a number w equals 2 plus root 3, flip the sign in the middle, and define its conjugate. But here's the confusing part. w is not just any irrational number. It is a number defined in what we call a quadratic ring. Unlike real numbers, our ring writes irrationals as a pair, treating the irrational root 3 almost like its own kind of axis. This means that for all purposes, we treat the irrational as if it is rational. In this altered system, taking modulo does not work how you would expect. If we were to take the real number value of w and take its modulo, we get other nonsense. Instead, we operate on individual components of the pair. This means that for all intents and purposes, 7 root 3 is now divisible by 7. At first glance, this feels like cheating. The rules have changed, but as long as it accounts for integers, that's all we need to test anyway. Alright, back to our w. These multiply to 1 and add to 4. Now define a sequence for positive integers sp equals w to the power of 2 to the p plus w to the power of minus 2 to the p. In this cool ordered collection, the first term is 4, and each successive term is just the previous term of squared minus 2. What the LLT states is that if the p minus second term is divisible by mp, where mp is equal to 2 to the p minus 1, then mp is a Mersenne prime. In other words, it is congruent to 0 modulo mp, which can be rearranged to look like this. What we need to realize is that raising something to a power of 2 is the same thing as squaring it repeatedly. For any number in modular arithmetic with prime moduli, squaring it causes these really interesting cycles. And even though w is irrational, our quadratic ring definition means it still goes through them. Now bear with me, this next step can't be proved lightly, so we're gonna go with the trust me bro approach. The number w just so happens to always go through cycles that loop back to 1 after p squaring's modulo mp. But wait, what's this? Yeah, exactly the statement that we previously found. The beauty of the LLT is that it operates on p, while Mersenne primes increase exponentially, and unlike Fermat's little theorem, it works 100%, no strings attached. This was the exact test used in the great internet Mersenne prime search, or GIMPs, and was responsible for finding this gem of a prime. But this isn't about math. For any prime, there will be infinitely bigger. At the end of the day, searching for primes is a test of computing power, not mathematics. But you gotta admit, it's pretty cool what it can find.